everybody. My name is uh, Philip Lonchevich. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Barcelona, and I'll be telling you about their work in phenotyping LV hypertrophy using multimodality imaging and machine learning. So when we use non-invasive imaging to screen patients, we always assess morphology and function to try to find signs of remodeling, which can guide the medical treatment and the need for clinical follow-up. So in this pretty straightforward workflow, the biggest challenge is, of course, clinical integration of imaging data, but it's not only imaging data. We always start with clinical data. So we look at the demographics, the comorbidities, the genetics, and then move over to imaging data describing structural findings and functional findings. Now, if we integrate uh, this data, we try to position the patients in a spectrum of a certain disease. And here it's pretty easy to define patients that have very healthy hearts and those that have extreme remodeling. However, the clinical gray zone where patients may have subtle changes or uh, overlapping phenotypes between diseases, this is where the, the, the biggest challenge lies. And indeed, in LV hypertrophy, we have overlapping phenotypes such as MAGI and ND. Uh, already mentioned basal septal hypertrophy, a structural finding can be seen in both hypertension and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, although the etiology of the finding is very different. In hypertension, it's related to a heterogeneous loading and wall stress distribution, whereas in HCM, it's related to genetic mutations of the uh, proteins of the uh, sarcomere resulting in altogether um, abnormal microstructure with this array of the myocytes, of the collagen, uh, abnormal vasculature, and similar. So obviously there's differences. So the question is, why is it clinically relevant to tell it apart? Uh, as we heard from uh, Valeria, HCM is related to, uh, 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 from Francesca, <laughs> HCM is related to elevated risk of sudden cardiac death, with, uh, which obviously influences clinical management. And since it's a genetic disease, we need to be aware of it so we can screen the relatives or take care that the children of the patient do not inherit the disease and, and similar. So all in all, distinguishing these etiologies is very uh, relevant clinically. So the question is, how do we do it? Well, if we have a tissue sample from the patient, then it's pretty straightforward. We can look at the microstructure combined with clinical context and get the answer. However, more, more, much more commonly, we don't have a tissue sample, of course, because it's very invasive. And then we rely on integrating available data, such as family history, the signs and symptoms the patient has, the genetic profile the patient has, at least with the tested gene, uh, genetic mutations, and of course, the non-invasive imaging phenotype. So if we focus on non-invasive imaging by itself, it's integration of findings um, all over again. So clinicians usually look for the patterns of hypertrophy, uh, comparing uh, is it symmetric or asymmetric, the distribution of fibrosis, the severity of alpha tract obstruction or the LV dysfunction, or the heterogeneity of deformation. So as you see, none of this is really specific for a certain etiology, but the combination of the findings points in a certain direction. And out of all of these, deformation heterogeneity is the least clinically used one, at least for now. So let's uh, look at this a uh, bit further. When we talk about deformation of the left ventricle nowadays in clinical work, we uh, always use speckle tracking echocardiography to look at the whole left ventricle or focus on certain regions that we find interesting, like the septum. We can do this with tissue Doppler imaging as well and get these color-coded maps of deformation, but whatever we use, we always end up uh, looking at deformation curves. And if you've never seen a deformation curve, when you clinically look at it, you always want to look at two things, the value of peak deformation, and the time it takes to reach peak deformation. So with these two simple measures, we can rec also start to recognize specific deformation patterns, which are defined by the uh, temporal strain components, right? And indeed, when we look at specific uh, etiologies like uh, amyloidosis, uh, we can see that the basal segments are contracting less and the apical segments are contracting more. And we get this specific apical sparing pattern of deformation or a Japanese flag. The left bundle branch block, which we heard about yesterday, also has a typical pattern of apical stretching and the septal deformation early on in the systolic uh, phase of the cardiac cycle, giving a typical septal flash pattern that we can recognize. Uh, 
Hypertension, on the other hand, has the basal segment deforming in a reduced manner and reaching peak contraction after the aortic valve closure, which we can define as post-systolic deformation, and this is related to the loading conditions of the left ventricle. And finally, in HCM, we can recognize non-deforming regions surrounded by regions of normal deformation or reduced deformation, and this seems to be very specific of HCM. So obviously, even though the ma macro phenotypes overlap, there are relevant findings in non-invasive imaging that we can recognize, and also there are chain, uh, differences in cardiac microstructure. Now, if we want to look at these microstructure differences in more detail, we can, uh, for example, image tissue with synchrotron imaging. Now, a synchrotron is basically a particle accelerator which accelerates electrons to very high energies, and in the end, they give us uh, X-ray beams of superior quality to that compared to, for example, CT devices. In general, this means we can get much higher resolution and higher co image contrast, uh, which enables us to look at fiber orientation, reconstruct the collagen matrix, and uh, look at vessels and their perivascular collagen. So together we wanted to see if we uh, performed etiology where interpretation of non-invasive data, can we relate the, these non-invasive phenotypes to underlying microstructure? And where is the role of deformation uh, patterns in all of this? So to, to do this, we looked at patients with obstructive left ventricular hypertrophy. What this means is that, that the basal septum is so thick that it prevents blood from leaving the left ventricle and causes severe symptoms to the patients. So these patients undergo septal myectomy, which is uh, open heart surgery to remove the thickened septum so blood can flow freely. So in these patients, we collect the medical history data, genetic data, we image them with echocardiography and CMR, and then they underwent surgical myectomy, where, as I said, it's open heart surgery, the tissue is removed and collected, and then imaged with synchrotron imaging. This altogether creates the multi-scale, multi-modality imaging protocol, which we performed on three patients. The first one had no family history of HCM in a negative genotype. His left ventricle was of normal size, but hypertrophied, and it showed a symmetric pattern of hypertrophy. The fibrosis inferred by late gadolinium enhancement in CMR showed only endocardial fibrosis, which is not typical of HCM. The deformation pattern here was very typical of hypertension, showing reduced basal septal deformation with post-systolic uh, deformation, which could also be seen in the transition towards the mid-septum and in the mid-septum as well. Tissue Doppler confirmed these findings. Now, when we looked at the removed tissue, we could see the fibrosis on the endocardial side and indeed image it with high-resolution synchrotron imaging showing the collagen structure. The rest of the myocardium showed vast interstitial fibrosis and arranged around normally oriented myocytes. And if we see the scan going throughout the three dimensions of the tissue sample, which is something we can only do with a synchrotron, we can see that the myocytes are indeed perpendicularly cut and oriented in the same direction, but also we can see this vast interstitial fibrosis spreading all around the myocytes. So we used the elastic and pixel classification workflow to segment uh, this uh, uh, collagen or fibrosis. And we saw indeed that the collagen was increased in this patient, showing completely normal spatial organization. So we could see basically almost layers of collagen surrounding normally arranged myocytes. The, the blood vessels here were of normal size and only mild wall hypertrophy with normal amount of perivascular collagen. So in conclusion, this patient's clinical data, when we integrate everything we have, points obviously to a more hypertensive phenotype since there's no family history, no genotype. The non-invasive imaging data uh, bringing together the pattern of hypertrophy, the pattern of LGE, and the pattern of deformation confirms this diagnosis, and all of this non-invasive phenotype is validated with synchrotron imaging showing normal organization of myocytes and collagen. Now, the second patient, on the other hand, had positive family history of HCM and a positive genotype. His ventricle was of normal size, but here hypertrophy was asymmetrical, located in the infraceptum. The LGE, or the fibrosis, was located uh, in the same region intramyocardially and at the insertion points of the left ventricle. This was a very typical pattern for HCM. The deformation pattern was also typical for HCM, showing that the basal septum 
performed uh, normal but reduced deformation, then the region going towards the mid septum showed virtually no deformation at all. And then in the mid septum, we saw uh, improved deformation again. Tissue Doppler confirmed this, showing uh, this region of non deformation surrounded by normal deformation uh, of the myocardium. When we removed the tissue, we saw a patch of endocardial fibrosis potentially related to the contact with the mitral valve, and the low resolution synchrotron imaging showed regions of normal myocyte organization, but interlaced with regions of myocardial disarray. Now, when we look at the section through the 3D tissue, we see indeed that on this side, the myocytes are again perpendicularly cut, but here in the middle, we see kind of this flow visualization, which is basically longitudinally cut myocytes, which means that this whole tissue has disarray of orientation of myocytes. Again, we can see a lot of fibrosis surrounding these myocytes, but here it is clearly even more increased, but organized in a completely abnormal way. So we can see collagen disarray with only small regions of normal this, uh, collagen organization, such as here or here. The vasculature had hypertrophied walls and increased perivascular collagen, which is again typical of HCM. So here in this patient, the clinical data pointed towards HCM, which is very always the cheapest and most important way to uh, look at patients. The non-invasive imaging confirmed these findings with a typical combination of a hypertrophy and LG distribution and deformation pattern related to HCM. And synchrotron imaging showed both collagen and myocardial disarray paired with abnormal vasculature. Finally, the last patient had no family history of uh, HCM and no genotype, and also he had no, she had no history of hypertension. She had a slightly enlarged left ventricle with a very extreme hypertrophy asymmetrically localized throughout the whole septum over here, and LG was severely uh, enhanced throughout the septum. The deformation pattern again showed virtually no deformation throughout the septum and when explored in more detail again we saw the basal septal deformation was normal, the transition towards mid completely abnormal and then improvement towards the apex. The removed tissue here showed really vast myocardial disarray and when we screened through the tissue we could see this very very dramatic uh, my, microstructural pattern of longitudinally positioned myocytes and perpendicularly cut myocytes and generally increased vasculature as well. So the collagen was not uh, elevated in this patient, probably due to a uh, younger age, but the spatial organization again showed the disarray of the collagen matrix. The vasculature, as I said, the tissue was hypervascularized with uh, mild wall hypertrophy, but increased perivascular collagen. So in this patient, the clinical data didn't tell us too much, but the non-invasive imaging data and the deformation patterns indeed defined this as an HCM phenotype, which was then confirmed with uh, the, with the um, uh, synchrotron imaging showing this very, very bad disarray uh, situation. Bear in mind, this patient had a negative genotype tested for the most common uh, mutations uh, that are tested in the clinical practice. So indeed, these spatial temporal patterns of deformation provide information on the underlying remodeling, and when combined with other non-invasive imaging findings, it allows more targeted phenotyping. And now going towards this targeted phenotyping, what this means in everyday workflow in, in, in medicine is that we try to gather as much information on patients and integrate it and try to position the patient in a spectrum of disease, which is a feat for itself. But if we relate this position in the spectrum with clinical risk, it can help us guide personalized therapy for this specific patient. Now, this happens in the clinical world every day in the workflow. However, it's challenged by observer variability. People interpret or measure things a bit differently. There's a limited set of parameters that we use. And also there's this tendency to discretize a complex diagnosis into sick or healthy when in fact it's a spectrum of changes. So obviously, uh, we believe that artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us in various steps of this clinical workflow over here. So going back to our patients from the initial slide, the idea is can machine learning help position these patients on the spectrum of uh, the remodeling uh, of the remodeling spectrum? 
And the first question to ask is what data can we extract from echo images to use as machine learning input? So we have the data and structure, for example, the dimensions of the septum or the ventricle or the infralateral wall. We can measure the areas of the cardiac chambers and extrapolate uh, volumes or ejection fraction from these measurements. On the other hand, we have descriptors of functions such as blood flow Doppler velocity curves. If we position the region of interest in the in between the atrium and ventricle, we get the mitral inflow, which describes the diastolic function. But if we position it in the outflow of blood from the left ventricle, we get the uh, LVOT outflow pattern, the velocity pattern describing systolic function. If you look at the tissue Doppler, uh, we can position the region of interest in the septal annulus. Um, and get the deformation, uh, get a velocity pattern describing both systolic and diastolic regional function, and of course the deformation curves from speckle tracking imaging. Now, all of this data obviously bears a lot of information, and we try, we would ideally want to extract all of the all of these velocity profiles to use for machine learning input, but. The, in standard clinical practice, such complex whole cardiac cycle data is very challenging to grasp for a clinician. There's in every uh, time point of the cardiac cycle, there's a different data point giving an immense amount of data, which can hardly be integrated in everyday workflow. And this is where machine learning can indeed help. It can help by reducing the dimensionality of the data and creating a low dimensional output space where patients are positioned based on the similarity of this whole cardiac cycle data. In such a space, the most important thing is to be able to interpret the patient's position, and we can do this by looking at echo and clinical characteristics of specific regions in our output space. So this is exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to see if unsupervised machine learning has the potential to explore the LV hypertrophy spectrum. So we looked at hypertensive patients, healthy controls, HCN patients, and individuals with a family history of HCN but no diagnosis or phenotype. So we used the deformation and velocity data from ECHO as a machine learning input and left the other variables as a way to validate the machine learning derived phenogroups. We used unsupervised multiple kernel learning to create this output space where patients are positioned based on similarity and then used multi-scale kernel regression to define the average uh, deformation and velocity profiles and clinical characteristics of certain regions in the output space and directly compared them with other regions in the output space. This was a way to explore the space so we can interpret it and understand it better. After that, we used k-means clustering to create uh, phenol groups, which were then analyzed uh, between themselves. So our first step was to look at hypertensive patients by themselves, and we created this out a common output space where patients were positioned based on echo function, um, and we decided to explore the first, second, and third dimension of variability. So we saw that the first, that the third dimension of variability actually encoded uh, clear signs of functional remodeling related to hypertension. We even saw the post-systolic shortening pattern that I described earlier. The clinical data, which was not input of the machine learning, uh, confirmed these findings, altogether um, telling us that the third dimension actually encoded functional impairment in hypertension involving both the left ventricle and left atrium. The second dimension, on the other hand, encoded a different thing, elevated heart rate, mitral inflow fusion, and associated structural and functional remodeling, while the first dimension determined shift in cardiac dynamics with later onset of atrial contraction and stretching of the left ventricle during isovolumic contraction. Now, with this uh, analysis, uh, we could better understand our output space, and now we could cluster the output space to see the phenogroups derived. The first phenogroup showed the normal cardiac function profile in hypertension. The second phenogroup showed a more transition from normal function towards remodeling. The third phenogroup showed ex uh, more advanced remodeling in hypertension with both systolic and diastolic impairments, while the last phenogroup showed a specific uh, group of female patients with a high burden of comorbidities and under beta blockage, so uh, under treated with a certain medication. So these phenogroups, which I really just go through here fast, there's a lot more data to show, are based on functional. Sorry? Yeah, Philip, you have to somehow make an ending. It's already more than 30 minutes, I uh, think. That you are uh, sure, sure. yeah, yeah, don't don't go through all the groups you have identified. 
Of course. Uh, Thank you. Uh, anyway, we validated this group by projecting healthy patients. We saw that they were indeed validated the healthy space and then used the same method to look at HCM uh, pheno group and saw that the relatives were in between the extreme remodeling phenotypes. We later projected the healthy and hypertensive patients in a common output space to show the spectrum of cardiac remodeling and then validated these findings showing that uh, these functional phenogroups correlated with CMR-derived uh, late gadolinium enhancement, which meant that our functional phenogroups actually had a structural remodeling as well. So, in conclusion, we could use machine learning to position our patients in the spectrum of disease uh, re uh, of functional remodeling and um, in hypertension. And furthermore, we see this as a way that uh, to include in a, in a standard clinical workflow where any new patient can be projected in our output space and this information can be used to aid in treatment decision, risk assessment and uh, frequency of follow-up. So, in conclusion, the non-invasive imaging can really be helpful in differentiating left ventricular hypertrophy. Spatial temporal information can really guide uh, understanding of microstructural remodeling and it bears a lot of information which can actually be harnessed with machine learning and if we use an interpretable machine learning manner we can really uh, explore the spectrum of remodeling and the relationship between genotype and phenotype. Thanks for your attention. If we have any time for questions I'll be happy to answer them. Yes, really, we do have some time for, for questions so audience please go ahead. Blanca, you had a question, please go ahead. Hi, Philip. Really nice work. Very, uh, very, very interesting. Um, I think my question is going to be quite, um, quite straightforward for you. Have you thought about including ECG features as well in your classification? Uh, yes, we actually recorded the, the that, that's that's a that's a very good idea. We recorded the digital ECGs of all these patients, um, but in a, a sense of order, first it was uh, the task to try to do it with echo data and then uh, work on extending it with ECG data. But uh, looking at uh, your work uh, on HCM, it definitely makes sense uh, to include ECG data in the machine learning. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to to see whether there is any association or, or kind of between different groups or, or at least whether the, the groups you obtain are similar or not when you use ECG or ECHO or the, 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 the combination of the two. So I think you have a much better database that we use, we had with Orleans work and um, it's a great opportunity. I think it's wonderful. Yeah, it's, Thanks. That would be super interesting. Thanks for the yeah, suggestion. Thank you. Amanda, please go ahead. Hi, Philip. Great talk. Thanks very much. Hi. I wanted to ask about your longitudinal strain. So you said that you use longitudinal strain to build in your model and mm -hmm. also on the clinical basis to try to differentiate between patients. Is that just four-chamber longitudinal strain or all the others? And would there be any value in adding the other, um, the two-chamber and the three-chamber one? Or mm -hmm. potentially, maybe because of the basal septal hypertrophy, you think that's not... Um, particularly relevant for HCM. No, no, that's a really good point and that's actually something that we plan to do in the next step. The next step is we uh, started a multi-center retrospective study looking at H HCM data to do the same thing with but with multiple center data uh, and what we decided to do is actually uh, include the two chamber and three chamber apical views as well, because in a disease such as uh, HCM, it's very heterogeneous and the thickening or dysfunction can actually be in different places in the left ventricle. Uh, this whole work was started a few generation of PhD students back in, in, uh, in this uh, group that I'm working with in Barcelona. And initially they were working with heart failure patients and heart failure patients, the heterogeneity is not that pronounced. So you can use four chamber and basically get the dysfunction, which is not regionally distributed. But in HCM, I definitely think that we should try at least to try to include it and then see if it brings any incremental value. If not, that's a good message as well. Then you can only use four chamber, which is much simpler. Oh, thanks very much. 
All right. I think. Yep, there's another question. Philip or Xiao. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, now I am mute myself. Yeah, very nice presentation. Good one, definitely. How do you do? Um, uh, my question is like, it's very like nice, and you group by all the people in yeah, in several in four groups in this case. But uh, what does it uh, mean for the people who afterwards? How do you apply it into clinics? Uh, do you give different treatment? Do, how fast can you place a person in such a group so that you can give a different treatment? Like yeah, this. as always, I mean, that's that's the that's when I explain positioning patients as a feat, uh, in a spectrum of diseases a feat of its own, but the clinical value comes with relating a position to clinical risk. Obviously, that's what we want to do, but in this data set, we didn't have outcomes, so we couldn't do it. And that's why uh, we're extending it to um, larger data sets of trials which have outcomes and then hopefully okay. we find a phenotype we can relate it to uh, clinical risk. Uh, but uh, definitely, I also think that besides just being focused on outcomes, if you have a clinical workflow where you image a patient with echocardiography, as Andy showed earlier and Chrissy as well, you have nowadays really automated uh, extraction of data from these yeah. images. And if you can also suggest that a patient is in a group of patients who have hypertension or have elevated remodeling or have ele elevated risk, I think that's also a very supportive tool for a cardiologist to re-examine a patient if he missed something or pay attention to a certain finding that he didn't really look at. So I think just uh, Positioning patients in a in a group of similar patients has a lot of value in the clinical practice. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Cool.